I'm going to talk about the ways in which artificial intelligence in five to ten years time, so relatively soon, might be very different from today's. In fact, I'm going to look at 12 ways in which it could be not just an extension of today's AI, but in various ways, uh, not at all what people are tending to expect. I'm going to draw on my experience from more than 200 public events with London Futurists since February 2008, when we have often talked about possible futures of AI. I'm also going to bring some insights from my professional experience, both as a software architect and as a futurist consultant. And what I do in that role as a futurist is I make the case that it is useful and helpful, important and also possible to split our focus in life across three perspectives at the same time. We have to look at the present. We have to be good at keeping the balls in the air, delivering on the commitments we have made to partners and customers and investors, practicing and prioritizing operational excellence. But at the same time, some management focus, whether in our groups or businesses, or also managing ourselves as individuals, should go to finding incremental improvements on what we are currently doing, looking to uh, future that is in a sense more of the same. New clients for our existing products and services or ways to enhance our products and services to make them cheaper or with more bells and whistles. And most good companies, most good organizations do the first two tasks pretty well. Where many great companies fail is in this third, spotting something that was not expected. This is the game change future, sometimes called disruptive change. It's when you aren't looking for something that is there, an elephant in the room or here an elephant on the footpath, which if you don't notice it, could charge at you and kill you, destroy your business, throw your own plans into complete disarray. But if you do spot it early enough, you can learn how to take advantage of it and ride it to greater progress than ever before. So as a futurist, I help people to spot the elephants, to see the disruptions coming and manage the response to these disruptions. And it's not just by looking more carefully, it's by looking in different ways. It's by having different conceptual filters. An example from my own past life, 25 years ago, my business card did not say futurist, it said software architect or perhaps software director, and I was engaged with my colleagues in Scion, the pioneering manufacturer of handheld computers based in London. We had, in the first dimension, the focus on the here and now. We were incrementally improving our first million selling handheld computer, which you can see there on the left from 1993. Then we were doing a significant step up, more of the same. We were designing a device that came out first in 1997 and this version in 99, which had a better screen, much better apps. It was a 32-bit operating system, whereas the previous one had been 16 bits. It had touch sensitivity and so on. But at the same time, we managed to realize there was a big elephant coming our way, which would mean that people would no longer be interested in these handheld computers. And eventually, we drew this picture picture envisioning the next 10 years or so of progress from about 1998. The trend that we were tracking ourselves in the parent company Scion was one of computers becoming more mobile, but we realized that another huge force, the elephant of the mobile computing industry, was going to disrupt our world with their phones becoming more intelligent, more smart. So we eventually we said, we have to adjust our business plans. We created a spin-off company called Symbian that attracted investment valuing us at 100 million pounds initially with investment from the big three phone companies of the time that some of you might remember, Nokia, Ericsson, and Motorola. And patiently, we adapted our platform to make it suitable for what would become the world's first successful smartphones. 
And eventually, after long delays, we did manage to sell our software as the operating system in 500 million smartphones. There were successes and there were failures. I've just time to give you four quick highlights about disruption. Highlights which I believe are going to apply to AI in the future too. Disruption often goes through a slow, disappointing phase in which everybody says, oh, not that hype again, before it goes through the fast and furious phase in which everybody says, why did no one tell us this was coming? It's the kind of exponential takeoff. There's also the fact that disruption is only successful when there's not just new technology, but also a whole ecosystem of partners, suppliers, application developers with their own positive feedback cycle. And I'm going to say more about positive feedback cycles. Disruption, by the way, comes in waves. And too many people are focusing just on the current wave or maybe the next wave without seeing an even bigger wave coming which is what I believe is the case for artificial intelligence. And each new wave brings its own new ideas and is typically led in part by new people. And finally, there's nothing inevitable about any of these disruptions. The technology makes them possible, but the actual outcome depends on human responses. And indeed, the future of AI is enabled by new technology, but it will be determined by what we humans manage to foresee and manage to do. So now let me look ahead. Well, actually, I'm gonna look ahead by briefly, again, looking backwards. My exercise in looking ahead five or 10 years from today could have been applied in 2010. And if it was done in 2010, most of the predictions would have been wrong. Why? Because in 2010, most of AI was dominated by what we now call classical AI expert systems which were incredibly successful in their own ways. They depended upon rules being captured by software engineers after talking with human domain experts. And there was lots of interesting progress to get excited about, not just logical calculations, but probabilistic reasoning. And there was some interest in machine learning and some interest in neural networks, but most people were pretty skeptical that neural networks could ever amount to much. Why? For empirical reasons, because neural networks only seem to work in a small number of domains. And there was also theoretical reasons. Some of the pioneers of artificial intelligence, some of my childhood heroes, in fact, Marvin Minsky, Seymour Papad, had apparently demonstrated theoretically in a book as long ago as 1969, that neural networks or perceptrons could not do much. So that was the past. But by 2015 to today, we look back at classical AI and we say, oh, that was good old fashioned AI. We are now moving much further forward with deep neural networks. Machine learning is now very successful in which the parameters are automatically trained. Of course, humans have to set the hyperparameters and set the design but much of the logic is sort of inferred by the machines themselves. And after lots of slow disappointment up to about the year 2012, there has then been this breakthroughs, this unexpectedly swift progress in image recognition, language translation, speech recognition, and all kinds of other fields. Enabled, we now see, by a number of breakthroughs, the fact that there was large amounts of big data, labeled, such as the ImageNet database created by Fei-Fei Li of Stanford, amongst others. There were improvements in hardware, GPUs and later TPUs that were very good at parallel processing. They were not designed initially for deep learning, but it turns out that GPUs are excellent in accelerating training. And then there was improvements in algorithms such as slightly different ways of doing the back propagation, slightly different ways of doing the calculations, and numerous innovations in design as to which kinds of convolutional layers in the deep networks. Could the same happen again? Could our excitement about what deep learning networks do us now, could that be overtaken by new breakthroughs in the next five to 10 years? I'm gonna argue 
that is quite likely. I'm going to argue that we will quite probably look back at today's systems rather fondly, and we'll smile and say, oh, good old-fashioned neural networks. And what we'll have in the future isn't just better neural networks and, by the way, better classical AI in some kind of combination, but new developments. And to get this kind of disruptive change, you, there needs to be a supply, a supply of ideas, a supply of people working on it, and a supply of funding. I'm going to argue that there are plenty of ideas which look promising, and there are plenty of people poised to work on these breakthroughs, and there is certainly lots of money available. There is no shortage because of the demand for improvements in AI. There are so many companies in so many industries who see the possibilities to extend their profits in, for example, algorithmic stock trading, healthcare, medicine, gaming, entertainment, engineering, science, creativity, and so forth. In industry after industry, there is huge pressure to invest in possible disruptive breakthroughs, looking at some of the ideas which I'm going to describe shortly. And there's not just a commercial competition driving this forward. There is a geopolitical competition. Indeed, we can say, not putting too fine a point on it, that the control of the world is at stake. And some people are waking up and realizing it, and others are sort of sleepwalking forwards. This, you may recognize, is the Chinese premier, Xi Jinping, who is giving a talk uh, filmed here on New Year's Day 2018, shortly after the China had declared its policy of becoming the world's leading AI power by 2030. And that, in turn, was shortly after China's best human player of the game of Go had been comprehensively beaten, unexpectedly, by software, Western software, software from Google's DeepMind group. And the Chinese who loved the game of Go thought that was unacceptable, and they've decided to invest substantially. And the reason I'm showing this picture is I'm told if you zoom in on his bookshelves, which some China watchers do, you will find books such as The Master Algorithm by University of Washington computer science professor Pedro Domingos. You will find Augmented Life in the Smart Lane by New York futurist Brett King. I just want to point out that the Chinese leadership are pretty sympathetic to engineering considerations and they are getting this. So there is a strong political competitive pressure to invest more in discovering the new breakthroughs. And there are plenty of people who are willing and able to work on this. We have more people in the world than ever before, but that's not just more mouths to feed. It's more people with brains and innovation. People, by the way, who are educated around the world to higher levels than ever before, who are networked using Zoom, using other networks more than before so that ideas can bounce around the world which leads more people to develop more tools and more technology. And by the way, with better technology, there are better networks and better education. So this feedback cycle grows, which is why we have more scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs knowledgeable and acting and making a difference in the world than ever before. We have more people who understand the principles of design, more educators. That's why we have more artificial intelligence being created, deep learning, driving progress in all these other fields, which is why there's likely more elephants of disruption ahead. Just one more word about these positive feedback cycles. I said, if you want to spot the elephants, you need to have different kind of conceptual models in your mind. It is useful to see what's caused progress in the past. The biggest change in history probably came from the series of industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution was when steam-powered machinery was developed, and it was developed by tools, crude, simple tools at first, but better machinery led to better tools, which led to better machinery, which led to better tools. The second phase of the Industrial Revolution from around 1880, according to various historians, included growth in synthetic chemicals, which needed to be built from chemical reagents. But the more synthetic chemicals there were, the more chemical reagents there were. The third industrial revolution involved computers 
gradually and then increasingly displacing humans from the workforce. Computers were difficult to build at first, but guess what? There is the field of computer-aided design, another field of computer-aided manufacture. So one generation of computers helps to design and manufacture better generations of computers. Another positive feedback cycle. And then with software. Software is built, of course, by software engineers, humans, but using software to help them. Tools like debuggers, compilers, profilers, analyzers, optimizers, which is why smaller <clears throat> groups of software engineers are now capable of building higher quality software than ever before. That's the past. The future will have AI built not just by human AI engineers, but increasingly by AI tools. This is what I'm going to zero in on in the next few minutes. So I hope I've made the case that there is plenty of supply of finance available, plenty of humans available to work on this. What I haven't spelt out yet, and which I'm going to do for the next five minutes or so, is look at some of these ideas. In fact, 12 ideas about why AI with these pressures could be quite different pretty soon. And the first is even bigger data. The problem with our current data sets is they don't cover all areas of learning with sufficient annotation. Well, we can now use one set of AIs to generate synthetic data and label it, which can then be passed to smarter AIs to learn from. It's early days, but remarkable things are being done. Also, we have one AI being used to clean up the raw data before being passed to another AI. So larger sets of AI uh, coming as a result. Is this just a quantitative change? I think it may well be a qualitative change as well. So bigger sets of data. But of course, where most people want to get to is the other direction. It's learning from smaller sets of data, not big data, but small data. After all, that's what young children can learn from. A young child does not need to be shown a million pictures of cats and a million pictures of dogs to be able to distinguish them. Somehow there's already enough learning in their brain from evolution, uh, which they can then adapt into new contexts to learn much more quickly. So this field of transfer learning and related unsupervised learning is potentially enormous once we can get it working. Somehow related is the idea that we can have self-learning systems, systems that could teach themselves more by reading all the text in multiple databases, multiple books around the world. If you can put in a sufficient seed of knowledge and understanding, that knowledge could grow quite quickly. Now, in the past, whenever this has been tried, it's become unstable. The systems have made false assumptions and they have generated nonsense alongside lots of genuine insight. Well, perhaps it's now changing. GPT-3 from OpenAI in some ways is surprising people by what it can do. Of course, it doesn't really understand yet, but in the future, maybe GPT-4 or 5 could go much faster. And we could have an unexpected iterative growth of common sense knowledge. The fourth thing I wanna look at is something that has become very successful in the last few years. Jan LeCun, one of the pioneers of deep learning, now uh, head high up in AI in Facebook, has described this field as one of the most significant in the last 10 years. It's when you use two different deep networks in some kind of competition with each other, an adversarial relationship. One of them is trying to generate fakes of a sort. The other is trying to discriminate the real ones from the fakes. And surprisingly, creative results are being achieved all the time. That's one way in which software engineers are copying an idea from evolution. Evolution has made lots of step forwards remarkably by arms races of one sort or another, predators versus preys. Well, the field of computer science has had for decades other people trying to copy evolutionary ideas such as genetic algorithms. They have not yet been particularly particularly successful or impactful in a commercial sense, but I remind you, neural networks were around for many decades before they broke through and were very successful. So that's one way in which we might learn from biology. Another way is when we learn from the biology of the brain. 
it's no surprise that many of the world's largest AI and IT companies have many PhDs from the field of neuroscience. And some of them are trying to copy things from the software of the brain. I can point to what Jeff Hinton is trying to do with his various formulations of capsules. Only loosely inspired by what may be happening in the brain, other people are looking more closely. There may be improvements in our software from that. There may be improvements in our hardware design as we copy some of the remarkably power efficient features of the brain's hardware that could come about. And sometimes that's called neuromorphic hardware. Another kind of hardware breakthrough could come from breakthroughs in quantum computing. This is particularly hard to forecast with any confidence, but I will say that people have already developed algorithms which could run faster and faster on quantum computers than on any other kind of processing. And there might be brand new AI algorithms which are enabled once people understand quantum computing more. That might break through. It's probably a bit of a low probability, but I don't want to rule it out. Then there are people who are copying another aspect of human biology, that's our emotional intelligence. The field of effective computing has made lots of breakthroughs in which software is taught to understand human emotions by seeing images of emotions on our face, including micro expressions. This software is able also to simulate emotions and it's able to manipulate human emotions, sometimes for good, sometimes worryingly. Other people are working on a smaller field. More radically, they are trying to understand consciousness and put consciousness into their AIs. This would not be artificial emotional intelligence. In a sense, it would be real emotional intelligence. The last two of the 12 I'll just run through quickly. There is the proposal by pioneering computer scientist Judea Perel that the big breakthrough will come when AI understands not just patterns of correlation, but the possibility of causation, realizing that when there is co correlation, at least sometimes there is causation. That might be the breakthrough. And finally, there is the idea that greater intelligence will emerge out of networks, decentralized networks, in which simpler components combine to create higher powers. That's probably what's happening in our human brain. There is no single master module in our brain, but our processing power arises, it seems, from this emergent network. And I point to Singularity Net, from Ben Gutzel as being the company that is making the best progress there. So 12 possible breakthroughs. How big an impact could these have? What kind of uh, timescales are we talking about? I have to say, nobody can say for sure because we don't know what's involved in making these breakthroughs a reality. And we don't know what will be unlocked as a result of these breakthroughs. It could be something small, it could be something larger. My advice is keep an open mind and beware of any dogmatic skeptics, including some AI professors who are, in my view, foolishly dogmatic in waving their hands and saying that none of this can make a big difference for hundreds of years, that there can be no artificial general intelligence for the foreseeable future. That is a dangerously uh, complacent attitude. Uh, bear in mind that experts, like other people, can indeed become trapped into their own paradigm of thinking. Great businesses fail because their leaders only see things as in the past. And I pointed out that pioneers of artificial intelligence, such as Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, fail to appreciate the ways in which neural networks might be different in the future. A single breakthrough from this list might open up many new insights. Just as if we go back way back in history, calculus opened up an understanding of huge numbers of different fields of science. Quantum mechanics with the breakthroughs of Schrodinger and Dirac and Heisenberg, 25, 26, 27, allowed many other physicists to make remarkable breakthroughs in short periods of time. Of course, there were the neural network breakthroughs in 2012 that caused large changes. So I am arguing that we should prepare now for potential breakthroughs and potential bad consequences. We do need to consider how this 
new breakthroughs could be steered or governed, we need to ensure that there is sufficient research into the potential issues arising. We should not follow the advice of Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, whose motto at many, for many years was simply move fast and break things. The consequences of moving too fast with AI without thinking of safety could truly be catastrophic. For five reasons, we could have the software that is very capable most of the time, but which harbors deep bugs inside its complex interlinking, especially if much of that software is opaque. Even if, secondly, even if the software has no bugs, it could be that the specification we have given it is actually in some ways incomplete and that when two AIs interact in various unexpected ways, there could be very bad consequences. We could talk about ways in which novel emergent capabilities might arise, just as we humans diverged from our evolutionary programming in many ways to care about more things than just the propagation of our individual gene lines. There is the risk that some of this very complex software could be hacked or misled by an adversarial attack. And the opposite problem, which is we may no longer be able to hack it, which means we humans who are supervising it or trying to observe it will lose the ability to turn it off if it starts behaving badly. And bear in mind that people using this software may have very different motivations. There could be military people who are in a hurry to get advantage of AI before their competitors and cut corners. This software could be used for a big brother surveillance by capitalists who are pursuing profit, profit, profit. And they may say that profit is always for the social good, but we know that sometimes that's not true. We can be afraid of this software being exploited by financial hackers, political hackers, or even fundamentalists of various sorts, religious fundamentalists or secular fundamentalists who have various suicidal tendencies or who hate humanity in some way or another. So this software, which could be more powerful more quickly than we expect, could have very bad consequences. It could also have very good consequences. I've written about these in some of my books, uh, potential sustainable superabundances within our grasp, including use of this AI to abolish aging, to transcend the naive and dangerous ways in which we're currently doing politics, and to lead us on a roadmap to flourishing transcendence by 2035. If we want to dig in more, I could talk about practical advice in terms of how we should be steering the software, but I think it's time for me to pause and open up for questions. I hope that was interesting and I hope that's given you some thoughts about not just today's artificial intelligence, but what might happen quite soon for good and potentially for ill too. Thank you.